ladies and gentlemen, it is our pleasure welcoming you at the uh, Center for Development Research here, um, and especially to the Right Life Field College, the RHC, our public uh, discussion, public panel discussion, as you can uh, see here already, on LGBTI rights in the development discourse. We are, of course, as the name says, uh, a development uh, research institute, uh, and um, within the RLC project, uh, we invited uh, two speakers and one facilitator from our institute um, to give some inputs uh, on uh, from their perspectives. We uh, welcome Kasha Jacqueline Nabatiseda from uh, Uganda. She's founder and director of Freedom and Rome Uganda. Uh, and uh, Christine Clapea, she's um, a researcher at the University of Vienna and Bayreuth. She's currently working on her habilitation project on Rainbow Aid Development Cooperation as a new arena for transnational LGBTI politics. And I think many of you uh, know um, Kasha already, not only since her famous um, report, so to say, or article in, in the Time magazine, uh, some time ago, there's more seats over there. Yes, looking forward to an interesting uh, late afternoon. We have only one hour, we have to admit. Um, and this hour will be kindly facilitated uh, by our um, uh, colleague, uh, Okay, well, I'd uh, like to say welcome to everybody for coming to today uh, for this uh, discussion on LGBTIQ in Africa. Um, in, in the interest of time, I'll, I will just quickly, first briefly introduce both our speakers, and I'll, and I'll actually um, read in order to speed this up, and then after that, they'll, they'll both give a brief presentation of their work, and we'll then open it out to questions um, and hopefully a lively discussion. Uh, first, I want to introduce the uh, speaker to my right, so Ms. Kasia Napatelvera who she received the Alternative Nobel Prize Right Livelihood Award in uh, 2015. And this was for, and I quote, for her courage and persistence despite violence and intimidation in working for the rights of LGBTI people to a life free from prejudice and persecution. Um, Ms. Nabagasera is the founder of Freedom and Rome Uganda, an organization which advocates and lobbies for policy change of discriminatory laws against lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex people in Uganda and Africa. Now, this is an organization she founded in 2003 and has led for 10 years. Uh, 2013, I understood that uh, um, Ms. Nabagasera moved from this organization to continue her work in this area. and. And it's actually also stated that she is considered as one of the most courageously outspoken human rights activists in Africa. She has lobbied and campaigned against several unjust laws in her own country and is a member of the steering committee of the Civil Society Coalition on Human Rights and Constitutional Law, which includes more than 60 Ugandan uh, human rights organizations that, come, that came together to contest what has been described as a draconian anti-homosexuality law. Among, among many other activities, Ms. Napagazera is also the creator of Kuchu, Kuchu Times, uh, established in 2014, and it's a platform that uses television, radio, and print media to raise awareness on LGBTI issues. This in initiative also includes the magazine Bombastic, which is used to share stories of everyday hopes and challenges experienced by Uganda's LGBTI communities. Ms. Nabagasera also works in coalition with sex workers, HIV AIDS victims, and women to challenge provision in the HIV AIDS Control and Prevention Act 2014 that stigmatizes these communities and LGBTI communities. Mm -hmm. um, second, I'd also like to introduce the other um, speaker today, so Dr. Christine Clapier. She is a transdisciplinary post a political scientist working in the field of gender, queer, postcolonial, and decolonial studies as well as in materialist lesbian feminisms. She is currently based in the Department of Development Studies at the University of Vienna, where amidst other scholarly activities, she's working on a book project entitled Queer Grifts, Development Politics, LGBTIQ Rights, and the Tra Trajectories of Transnational Solidarity, 
with this work. Uh, Dr. Kapia is particularly interested in how LGBTIQ issues and the legal and social realities of sexual minorities in aid-receiving countries are being framed, represented, negotiated, and discussed within current development politics. More specifically, Dr. Clapier argues for a critical analysis and problematization of the governing frame structuring the current pairing of development politics and, dis and discourse. Of course, without denying that there, there is indeed massive state-sponsored homophobia in Africa and elsewhere. Dr. Kapir believes that it's only when scholars, both scholars and activists, seek to move beyond um, what is now seen as hierarchical binaries of perceiving the West as homo-tolerant, or one might even say homo-developed, um, and the rest as not, that we'll then be able to, and I quote her, interrogate here and see multiple forms, modulations, and transnational entanglements of political and economic inequality with homo and transphobia. So on that note, I would like to pass. <laughs> well, thank you for being here, but um, I think I'll just continue from the last point you made about uh, the West being more homo-friendly or more homo-developed than Africa. Because we've seen many friends of ours in the West actually thinking that we are very background, back, backward in Africa or that we don't even have the competence to speak for ourselves. And this is evidence because we've seen so many people who have partnered with us but sit in their air-conditioned offices in New York, in Washington, and actually sit to think for us what to do, thinking that actually they are more advanced than us, they know our stories better than us. And this has caused a lot of friction between us and our partners. Um, for example, in Uganda, we've had, uh, we've had activists in the West who have come up with protests against our government, written to our government, pushing for the recognition of LGBT, but causing a backlash for us without actually even uh, contacting us on, on the grassroots. And it has not only caused a backlash, but it has made very many people stop supporting us because they feel that the West is supporting us more. And that's why we formed the Civil Society Coalition to get other organizations in the country that are not only LGBT, but also human rights, health, children, to come and show the country that actually we have people in our country who can support us apart from the West supporting us. And also the issue of, um, of, of people thinking that the aid they give our government is, has to come with ties. It has caused a backlash. We've seen where even our, our own selves in the country have been attacked by just citizens because they feel the, the aid that we've been getting. For example, hospitals are no, no longer getting medication because, for example, the World Bank recently cut a grant to Uganda and people th thought that it was because of homosexuals and that caused the backlash and people started looking for anyone suspected of being homosexuals because they felt we are the ones who are leading people to die. So this topic has really been uh, very broad for us to, to break down. And then we, we've we seen a, a wave. We've seen a wave of new colonialists coming to Uganda in the name of evangelicals with very funded uh, projects coming to the country in the name of saving Africans, building schools, building hospitals, uh, building churches, but they are coming with hidden agendas. In 2009, we got a group of uh, American evangelicals who came to Uganda. Um, and came with an anti-gay propaganda and caused a lot of panic in the people that we are here to recruit their children, that we are here to, to, to kill the traditional family, which is a mother, father, two children, and a dog. And so people got a panic. People got a panic and started petitioning the, the, the parliamentarians to actually do something about it. Already on our laws, we have uh, life imprisonment, if you're caught in a homosexual act. But when these evangelicals came to Uganda, they came and said that we are taking advantage of that law because no one is going to catch us in the act. So they need to stop us from even just being who we are. They need to stop me from even going back on TV and saying I'm a gay. And so they proposed the death penalty because that's how they felt that um, they should deal with the issue of homosexuality. And so our friends in the West, when they saw that um, a proposed law to kill us came up, they started taking, uh, taking over our struggle feeling that for us we are incompetent to deal with it. We saw the Prime Minister, um, the Foreign Minister of Canada attacking our Speaker of Parliament 
uh, in Canada in open. And so she felt humiliated and felt that she was being told what to do. And what happened? She came back to Uganda and promised to pass the law. And so that caused the backlash. And she said, the West cannot tell her what to do because this, um, this prime minister, we sent out a letter to all our partners abroad saying that, please, sometimes we need quiet diplomacy so that it don't cause a backlash. And sometimes we need you to go on the streets because that works best for us. But we've seen our Western partners ignoring our call to action because they feel they know better than us. And that's how the bill ended up being passed. And it's the first bill that has actually been passed in front of media in, in the history of Uganda. Because our president wanted to show the ways that you cannot tell us what to do. But all this was caused because our partners did not listen to us. And that means that they feel that they are better off than us. They know what, what is more uh, important for us. And so we've seen this trade going on and on and on. And people forget that all the problems we are having came from the colonials. Before the colonials came to Uganda, we didn't have these laws. We didn't have this Bible that is calling us sinners. We didn't have the laws, uh, the draconian laws that are calling us criminals. But people are forgetting that they have to actually look back to the root causes of the problems we are having in Uganda before they start thinking that we have to move <coughs> on the same page as the Western as the Western community. So we've seen that the issue of aid, solidarity, people thinking that we are so incompetent of, of our knowledge has caused a backlash in many African countries. Um, for example, when the anti-gay bill was passed in Uganda, we saw Western countries coming out and saying they're going to cut the aid. And of course, African presidents felt that they are being told what to do. Then Kenya came up and says, we are going to pass the same law and we'll see what you're going to do. The same thing happened in Gambia. They said, we have our money. We're going to pass the same law and we see what you're going to do. So it causes a backlash if you come with ties with development aid uh, to Uganda. But also, us as activists have gotten problems uh, sometimes because the people we partner with somehow give us false information because we feel that the partnerships are supposed to be mutual agreement and mutual understanding. So you get friends thinking that they're going to understand you, but all of a sudden they take over your struggle. The next thing you know, they're the ones writing to the press about what is happening in your country without you knowing. And by the time you, you contact them, it's already gone viral. And then the issue also of media, uh, people exaggerating our stories, because that is what sells. And you know they don't contact you to, to, to find out, is it really true what is happening? They just want to sessionalize everything because that is what is selling. So really, this issue of, um, of the West and the Global South somehow needs to come to, to a middle ground and understand how do we benefit from each other? Because of course we have to work together, but you have to respect the Global South because I believe we know our situation better than any person in the West. Yeah, so I'll stop there. <laughs> okay. <That's>, okay. <laughs> because I'm trying to time. <laughs> That's not good. Okay, but so um, maybe it's good to say that I think with all the critique uh, Kasha articulated, I think it's my responsibility also to, you know, um, engage with the development apparatus in the global north. So I see myself as a queer scholar and also as a queer activist that I have to, you know, to do the critique um, of the institutions like directly here in the global north. So what I'm trying to do in my research is to ask the questions, how does it come that some bodies start to matter in a cer certain field. So it's a question always uh, Judith Butler, a queer theorist, asks. Why do certain bodies come to matter? Do they matter because we really think they should have human rights? Or do they matter because we need them for something else? I mean, yesterday we had this, you know, bomb attack. I think you all read about that. So the question is, why do certainly these bodies who have been dying yesterday matter in the international discourse and also to the US government and not all the LGBTIQ bodies before who have been murdered, who are not like able to spend blood or who have been you know, violated, who have been de denied access to health. And I think it's the same question we have to ask in, in the field of development politics. How does it come that all of a sudden LGBTs have come to matter in that field. 
And I think from, from my perspective, it's, it's very important to take up a historical perspective. And some scholars argue that, you know, attention for non-normative sexualities is something completely new in the field of development. And of course, it's not something completely new. We have a long like, history and genealogy of you know, problematizing the sexualities of the global south. We had that in colonial times, they were the barbaric ones. They were those who were promiscuous, who had not, you know, um, monogamous families, the nuclear family. We had to civilize them. I really speak of the we. Um, then we had, you know, the after World War politics, suddenly there was the fear of overpopulation. And then again, the third world women became the target you know, of interventions. Again, there was this clear boundary between developed sexualities and underdeveloped sexualities. So what I'm saying or try to say is that we, if we want to analyze why do LGBTIQ rights suddenly matter in the development discourse, we also have to, you know, look in the history and see how sexualities and also gender relations had always served as a kind of boundary marker to say this is civilized and this is underdeveloped, this is modern and this is traditional. And I would say that again we are nowadays confronted with a kind of new civilizing mission and I think Kasha already outlined you know this idea that you know that people and also people in development politics you know perceive um, the global south and I think particularly Africa as a kind of backward region or whatever, a, a backward uh, region which is, you know, um, which symbolizes in a way the past of Europe or the US. In a way it's also a temporalization of so like um, power inequalities. This was where Africa is now, Europe has been 100 years of, of, ago. You often read that, you know, metaphor in the newspapers. Like time is a very interesting, you know, tool to construct development and underdevelopment. So what I think is what really the problem is when we look at, at not only the development discourse, but also the, the development politics, that we can imagine kind of transformation towards more justice for, for LGBTIQs only in a modernization frame. It's, you know, it's always from there to there, and Europe and the US is already there, and the others are there, and there's only one unilinear idea of how, you know, LGBT justice can be reached. And of course, when the Europe is there, they think they have the knowledge, you know, the gift the others, you know, you go, you go in a time machine and then you fly there in the past and tell them how they can reach modernity. So I think, and, and I think also what, what Kasha outlined is that that the problem is, of course, that there is a, a certain culturalization of hormone transphobia. It's not seen as a very complex outcome of, of very complex political circumstances. It's, it's, I mean, political homophobia, it's not something you know you have because you live somewhere or you are from a certain regions. But the idea of tolerance and the idea of homotolerance is often very much much like culturalized. Certain people have the ability to be tolerant and the others have to learn tolerance. So again we have this reinstantation of this idea of the modern European Western subject who is able to perform actively tolerance and the construction of the backward other. And I think LGBTIQ rights really have this new um, significance in drawing this line between modernity and, and backward or tradi the traditional region, the others. I think uh, two or five years ago I would have sit here and said okay it's 
women's rights who have this function. When you, when you look at the war in Afghanistan, then it was women's rights who really had this boundary function in between the, the others in then. So um, I think um, when we really want to see what, what homophobia does or how homophobia and transphobia works, it's what, what already you said in the introduction. We really have to be very, very, you know, very sharp in our mind and to go away from these dichotomies. Because political homophobia and political, and that's why I speak of political homophobia, um, has some functions in different states, in different regions. We have a massive homo and transphobia in Europe. And it also serves um, some uh, political reasons. So um, maybe I also should end here. <laughs> we like it abrupt. <laughs> no, but but I think that's my my main point. So to, to go beyond this dichotomic framing of of LGBTIQ rights. So I want to see if there are any questions. I also have some questions. So maybe as you people are thinking of questions you might have, I'll, I'll start. I have two questions. Um, two people. Maybe I'll start with Kasha first. At some point, you said, um, "How how do we benefit from each other?" So you're talking about the, 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 the challenges of, of 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 people taking over your struggle. But but I'm, perhaps I want to throw that question at you and ask you maybe how might we benefit from each other? In this? Yes, I, I feel that we can all learn from each other when we respect uh, because we know that the West has been where we are today in Africa and there are some things that they did that we can pick a leaf from and use in our context because we live in totally different contexts. But not everything that they did that we, um, can be um, useful in our context as activists because we come from different um, social backgrounds, we come from different political backgrounds, uh, and even our continent is very, uh, is very, what do they call it, homo, it's, it's not, hmm? it's very diverse, you know, uh, so um, I feel that we can learn from each other mm -hmm. in that way, mm -hmm. and for us, because we know these there's more resources we can also get to be able to drive our agenda. But that resources shouldn't come with, uh, with strings attached to it. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, because some people are taking advantage of our situation because they know they're going to come and give us grants. Eh? And they feel that they know better than us. So someone thinks that you're supposed to be dealing with HIV AIDS today. Yet for you, you feel actually Maybe it's not what we want to deal with at this particular moment. Mm -hmm. And so when people want to support you, they come with strings attached. And so this is where I say we need to find a middle ground. How do we support each other? And how do we not take over people's struggles? Because we know our situation better than anyone else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, a very interesting point. And I don't know, as I mentioned, if people have questions, do raise your hand so I can uh, take questions. Um, but before I ask uh, um, Christine a question, what makes me, this makes me wonder is how come, this point about history repeating itself. So the issues we're talking about now, we saw um, in the 80s or 90s with, in terms of, of uh, uh, feminism and the category woman and taking over struggles in terms of uh, talking about uh, female um, circumcision or female genital mutilation versus questions about uh, water and other issues that women perhaps on the ground are interested in. And I find this point interesting about this history repeating itself. But maybe in, in, in talking about history repeating itself and much of this also coming from, I would say, the um, uh, scholarship around uh, uh, certain issues, in this case LGBTIQ, issues. What I wanted to ask you, Christine, is how can we in academia um, avoid the construction of these concepts and, and theories and grand narratives of now gayness, queerness, mm -hmm. and even heterosexuality that in many ways end up subsuming what's actually happening on the ground? The I think that's a big question because it also has to do with uh, the canon we have in academia and the, the canon in academia is, is quite, you know, it's quite white, male and heterosexual to say it. And I always say that and, and people don't like me for saying that uh, on conferences, 
But for me, the first step is, you know, to, to go beyond these epistemic limitations and, you know, try to read different texts and also to broaden um, the acknowledgement what is being, you know, integrated as academic knowledge. You know, texts have to be published in certain journals and certain books. What I always do is, you know, that's why I followed also the, the work of Kasha. I always read, not only read, I listen. I try to listen. That's also what Gayatri Spivak, a very famous post-colonial theorist, says. Um, we have to unlearn privilege and we have to learn to listen. And I think that, the, the, you know, to be able to listen, you really have to learn that because you grow up in a certain society where, you know, your, your kind of whiteness, your class status, your, your educational background, you know, you unlearn to listen. And this is for me also a really important question, you know, to read with my students and to, to, to read with my colleagues, not only the hard um, scientific uh, works, but, you know, to really follow and also to see contradictions and ambivalences and not, you know, to search for, for this grand theory. I mean, there is no, in a way, there is no truth, there is no good theory, no good explanation, but you know, also to keep in mind that contradictions can be extremely productive. So I think it's this epi going epistemically beyond established narratives also. Yes. Um, terminology is often important in dialogue and discussion. Um, here in the North we have LGBTI, sometimes a Q, sometimes an asterisk uh, after it, and often that ends up with queer. Mm -hmm. um, what about the South? Do the same terms resonate in the South? Or um, do you, what about gay? Does gay work at all? Or gay and lesbian? And are you talking about the same terms, North and yes. South? In Uganda, we use LGBTI. We are the only country on the continent that actually puts the I there. Uh, and it's because we found out that uh, we are leaving out a certain section, a certain minority section in, in our own community. And the only way they would come to us is if we include it. But uh, we have our own terminologies that we understand in our own dialects. For example, in Uganda, we use the word kuchu because people feel that we can, we can, we can understand each other more using terminologies uh, that are already in our society than just calling ourselves LGBT. But the reason why we picked up we picked up LGBT is because it's the national language that is used. Actually, right now it's no longer LGBTIQ, and the the UN approved SOGI because some states who are not uh, comfortable with uh, the words like lesbian, like gay, they preferred at least sexual orientation and gender identity as a common language because some people feel at least they can do with that that is not so much into their faces because sometimes you go to lobby some people and the moment you say the word lesbian, they become very uncomfortable. But when you say so, at least they will sit and listen because of, of the comfort maybe it gives them or it doesn't expose them. So it depends uh, according to country, but at the UN now it's soggy that is actually being used because some states were like, they are very uncomfortable with the words lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Mm -hmm. But for us in Uganda, you, you, it's, you only find us saying LGBT when we're in government meetings, ministries. When you find us in NGO world talking to ourselves, we're always using kuchu. Can I say something to that? It's just, I, mean, I think it's also important that, you know, it has become a condition. Like, if we want to have money from donors, of course, you have to use certain terminologies. Mm -hmm. And I just recently read an article in Bambasuka Press where, where an activist was really also saying, you know, that invisibilizes permanently also, like, regional or, like, terminology which we want to use. But I think it's also the same in... In, in, in European or in Russia, in Russian countries, where when you want to have want to apply for funding from the EU, you have to use certain terminologies, and they are getting you know globalized. But we are not the same, in a way, because we face different 
asymmetries and different power relations in a way. And I think it's a, a, a strategic but also sometimes a, a very violent question if you have to stick to these terminologies in a way. I don't know how, how yes, you describe Yes, because for it. us to be able to actually get a seat on the Global Fund uh, country mechanisms in Uganda, we had to go away from using LGBT because they felt there's going to be a backlash that people attack the country that they are now promoting homosexuality. Mm -hmm. So we had to use MSM mm -hmm. or sexual minorities so that, so mm -hmm. that we don't put it out there, people to mm -hmm. think now that, that they're promoting homosexuality. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this uh, point here is making me think, I suppose, uh, questions around uh, strategy, so to speak. And, and when you were talking earlier, Kasia, you talked about this point of quiet diplomacy. And what it made me wonder about is, um, uh, um, I think I uh, understood somewhere that some, some people on the ground say that perhaps don't ask, don't tell is a wiser and safer strategy than coming out. And I wanted to know what you think about this. Uh, the, strategy. The, issue, the issue of strategy is some, you have to know the, the context you're working in. You need to know the environment, what works best in this particular environment. For example, when the bill was first introduced in 2009, we wanted the whole world to know what was happening. Mm. That was the only way we were going to get people to support us, to know that we are about to be killed. So we called for the whole world to go and demonstrate on the streets, to write statements, to write petitions. Avaz made a very big uh, petition because we wanted the world to know what was happening. And then actually, we even called for a threat to aid ourselves. We did, because I, I, I was addressing the European Development um, Corporation meeting. <coughs> and after leaving home, we, we sat with our partners and we said, how can we scare the country? What is the best strategy right now? And that was what came out. And then after the government started, the president came out and said, we need to go slow with this. This is a foreign policy issue. They said they had worked. Then we called and said, do not cut aid. That, mm -hmm. that is not what we want. Because now we are in a different environment mm -hmm. and different contexts. So when we say quiet diplomacy, because we know what is happening on the ground, mm -hmm. so we tell our partners, please just lobby quietly. Uh, the capitals, the government, quietly, like when Clinton called the president, uh, Obama, the president every time came out and said, every, t every phone call I'm calling is about homosexuality. Then we're like, okay, mm -hmm. that one is working. Mm -hmm. You know, quite diplomacy. And then some people went out of what we had called at a particular time and caused a backlash, like the foreign minister of, of Canada, mm -hmm. and everything went <coughs> sour and bad, and the bill was passed. So it depends on the environment, and that's why I say our partners should always contact us on the ground to ask us how best can we support you, because sometimes we might just need phone calls. Sometimes we might just need you not to do anything. So it's always best to really get in touch with the people on the, on the ground to tell you, to advise you how best to, to help. Mm -hmm. Is it, is it that? No, it's a bit of a question. Yeah, it should be. Just try to. <laughs> All right, I'll just try again. For maybe a spawn of a younger generation, when did prosecution of LGBT people, humans, uh, start? What is the driving motivation behind, actually? Uh, and uh, when, since when is it actually a topic that you can actually talk about? For example, in, Uganda or neighboring countries or nations. I didn't get the question. All right, uh, I just repeat it. Um, what is the driving motivation behind prosecution? Mm, okay. uh, and since when? Since when? When did it start? Actually, just for for my knowledge. And uh, since when is it? Is it a topic that you generally can talk about? Mm. It has always been talked about, but it was not provoked until we got the, these um, evangelicals that are moving and came and caused a panic attack in Uganda because they had failed to sell, to sell their agenda in America. And so they said to take advantage of poor countries and, uh, and of course, religious countries like Uganda. And so they came in the disguise of aid, uh, but they, were, they came with their own agenda. And actually, I attended, attended the, the workshop, three days workshop, and they kept referring to me, Kasha, we love you, but we hate what you're doing and all this. And 
when I was seated there, I saw that people even who came without having hatred left with hatred because they had been told lots and lots of um, of things that caused the panic. Um, how we are, how we work in abortion clinics, we are going to kill the, their children, we don't like children, we are going to recruit their children. So they caused a panic attack and that began in 2009, but had already been there in 2007 when they first when, when we held our very first press conference calling on uh, the government to leave us uh, to stay in peace. So uh, a gay movement was born, anti-gay movement was born by politicians and uh, religious leaders and the protests began uh, uh, on, on, on streets because they said, how dare we even go to the media? Because at least they preferred us to, to stay underground. But so now they said, oh my God, this is insane. How can they go on TV and say they are gay and all this. What are the children going to think? What are the other people going to think? So that now started being a backlash. But it had also caused visibility. People began now talking about it. But in Uganda, it wasn't just the birth of our, of our organizations. Because in, 2000, in 1999, the Uganda has always been known in the fight against HIV as actually one of the leading countries. And in, two, in 1999, a BBC journalist asked President Museven during the International HIV AIDS Implementers Meeting in South Africa. But in, this, in, this, in all this fight against HIV and uh, homosexuals included, and the president said, we don't have homosexuals in Uganda. And so we said, we need to do something. And for me, that was actually uh, during the year I began my activism uh, at university when I was 19. So we, 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 we actually played a part to say we do exist. And we, we, we made a false wedding and linked it to the, to the press ourselves, a gay wedding, because we wanted to show them that we are there. And so we sat as a friends. We're not even political, we're just social friends who used to meet and drink and said, what do we do to get to the media to show the president that actually we do exist? And so we forged a wedding, the gay wedding. And so when it went in the media, the president ordered to shoot all homosexuals. And that was the start. We said, okay, we cannot just be a social movement. We need to do something about it. And that was, that's what happened. So when the evangelicals came and even started uh, meeting with the president, with the members of parliament, uh, calling for um, tougher laws. We saw that actually now things were getting out of hand. And we had to get a force within the country, not only international solidarity, that's when we formed the civil society coalition, because we wanted mainstream human rights organizations mm -hmm. to join us so that even the country can know that we are not standing alone. So people talk about it during elections, people were using it. The Speaker of Parliament uh, last month when she was campaigning to retain her, her, her seat, she said, if you vote me back, I'll bring back the anti-homosexuality bill. And so everyone was up in arms. So it has always been used as a scapegoat to, for political gain. But even every time there's a crisis in the country, for example, when they're debating oil or the budget and everything, someone brings it up because they want to distract. They know this is the mm -hmm. only topic that unites the opposition and even the ruling party. It knows it's the only thing that actually brings the Muslims, the Catholics, the Protestants mm -hmm. together. So they always find something that will bring everyone together and cause a distraction. So it can be talked about anytime. Sometimes it's very quiet. Uh, no one is talking about it. We're not receiving any attacks. We're not getting reports from our members being evicted. And then you wake up in the morning and someone is on TV and radio bringing it back and then the violence will continue. Mm -hmm. But I think from, from an international relations perspective, I think it's also quite interesting, you know, that like from around 2009 and 2011 on, it, you know, it really became an, a topic in like how states interacted with each other. And also it was really inscribed into the idea of Europeanness. And I think what, what's kind of interesting, and, and you correct me if I'm wrong, that sometimes homophobic or state homophobia, like for instance in Uganda, is um, constructed as being uh, anti-colonial or anti-West uh, as a um, rhetoric, you know, against uh, the European hegemony. 
And so it's 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 really becoming a very very complex subject because they saying you know you, you we had colonialism um, for so long time and now we do what we want and we want to be homophobic in in a very weird way, and I think it's it's very important to see these parallels the way how Europe really inscribe that idea that, that the boundaries of Europe are made up of, of homo tolerance. They institutionalize this as a criteria for, for the enlargement process in, in Central European Europe and now with Turkey it's also an important um, subject. And with that, it became a, a really important point in, in these international relations. Not really, but it did become an important point. And to see these, you know, triangulations between, I think, homophobic violence in, in for, for instance, Uganda, and how Europe or the U.S. reacts when, for example, Hillary Clinton speaks out for universal LGBTIQ rights that can be can have a very progressive impact, but it also can have a very ambivalent outcome. I think from my from my point of view. Actually, she's not being supported in Uganda yeah. at all. And yesterday, the whole of social media was very very homophobic in Uganda. People were so happy, and they were telling Obama to first clean his home before he can start telling, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Africa what to do. So it's really complex, mm -hmm. and that's why you see sometimes we prefer it silent diplomacy so that we don't wake up mm -hmm. the sleeping dogs back home. Mm -hmm. Yes, just to, to let you know that uh, we, we are stopping this new trend of, of uh, radical evangelicals from moving around, uh, around mm -hmm. the world and spreading their propaganda. So we are suing the Americans who came to Uganda and uh, and already we first we passed the first phase because uh, their lawyer was trying to to stop the case from going ahead that it's not a case against humanity but the judge ruled in our favor and so now we are going to go for the first conference in, in Massachusetts because they, they they were planning to go around the whole of Africa but that's when uh, we we said we need to stop them but they had already gone to Russia and Moldova. And we see that all the all the countries they went to are the ones who came up with these new anti-gay laws. And, and, and since 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 the court case, they've stopped moving around. <laughs> but talking about um, in some ways potential, or in this case potential successes, I'm wondering to see um, in moving away from or interrogating the binaries, um, moving away from using this notion, idea of Europeanness versus other, some otherness. I wanted to know what role you feel critical feminist, postcolonial, and, and decolonial theories play to play in this. Because I understand this is the area you're looking at. Uh, that's a quite hard question because it's often said, you know. What we, th what we think in academia, you know, it's just, you know, like thinking around and has no, you know, material effect. But for me, it's very important also to, to change the attitudes and the practices of queers and not only queers who are working in, in the concrete development industry. Let's call it industry because it is an industry. And I think there are a few who really, you know, try to embrace that critique. And for me, it's also important, you know, it's not an option to say, okay, we, we deconstruct all uh, development cooperation because I think it's important because they, there are resources needed and there is a structural inequality and resource, it's important to provide resources. But for me, these theories can play an important role to... Um, reflect on these dichotomies and really change practices because I think it is possible to change practices. I think with, with always like, you know, the hegemony is bad and we can't go beyond, that's too narrow for me. And I think the development apparatus and everything like the human rights concepts can be subverted and appropriated appropriated by us, by, by critical LGBTIQ, feminist, social justice, Kutu activists, whatever you might add here. I think we can really 
subvert that and we should do that. We should really uh, get the money also, you know, and to get the resources and that they can help with that. Um, but this, on this question of, 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 of rights, one of the things, um, and, and I also recommend for those who are in ZEF, although we don't have enough resources on this topic, there is a book in the library which, which can give you at least a, an, an initial entry uh, think about this topic. But one of the things I'm thinking uh, from this book by Mark Atkins is he, he talks about perhaps in, in maybe and this is question for both. We might be better off if we don't talk so much about rights, but rather talk about justice, mm -hmm. because rights are always associated with Western ideas mm -hmm. of, of, of humanity. And I want to know whether you agree with this or with uh, for both of you this question, or whether you think you no know, rights still has. The thing is uh, this: we can't we can't stay away from the the rights, the, the word rights or the rights issue, because it's part of humanity. We just need to, to, to continue to, to preach to the unconverted, to understand it, but also the issue of justice. For example, the LGBT issue, if people do not understand, and this is what we are using, like for example, at the African Commission uh, on Human Rights and, uh, and uh, African Commission, uh, uh, which is the European Commission here, we've been trying to, to, to get states to say, okay, even if you do not accept that, hom uh, that homosexuality exists or homosexuals are human beings and all this, but at least you can agree that you need to protect them from violence and, and prosecution. And it took us quite a number of years to get to them to, un to really understand that. We didn't tell them to give rights and all this. We simply said the issue of violence needs to be worked on. We are seeing a lot of corrective rape happening. We are seeing a lot of murder. And after a long time, finally a, a, a resolution was passed because they understood that the issue of violence, no one deserves to be violated or attacked and all this. So it depends maybe even on the context where we come from. As I said, everything needs a strategy. What is going to work best in, in certain reasons? And even wanted to get wanted to get um, observer status as the coalition of African lesbians. And we've been, we've been fighting this since 2006, the commission. And of course they said, you, the work you do is not a human rights issue. Mm -hmm. So you cannot get the work. And so we used the issue of violence to get the observer status. And we did finally get it, even if now states at the AU are trying to challenge it. But at least we know it's there and we can continue going back and forth. We don't care. We have. We have the guts to do it, but even at the resolution, at the UN resolution 1719, many states, Islamic states, uh, Islamic states had refused. Um, African group, the African group had also refused the issue of resolution, uh, the Brazilian resolution. But resolution 1917, I mean 1719, was passed on the issue of protection from violence. So even the language we use, the terminologies we use, because if we start going into rights, we shall hear many of the um, of the states, from, for example, from Africa, mm -hmm. organization mm -hmm. of Islamic art coming out and saying that is not even in the in the Universal Declaration. Mm -hmm. So if we stick to things that can resonate on humanity, I think we shall get somewhere slowly by slowly. But the moment you say rights, they're like those are not rights. Mm -hmm. Um, I would also say that rights are a very powerful concept and we can't get rid of them in a way. But probably I'm a bit more ambivalent with rights. But I think it also is very context specific. I think it's important to take a kind of rights critical perspective, especially in the, in the European and, and US context, because we have a uh, a political scientist called that a uh, aristocratization of our societies. It said that you know that the right and the truth is spoken at the court, and you know that you know puts political struggles into the court and leads to a depolitization of civil society. So I think that's a kind of critical point for me that you know it's LGBT rights are now at the European court or, or at, at national courts. It's not about political movements, but they say, okay, lesbian couples are allowed to do donor insemination. It's not a, an outcome of that a huge mass of you know LGBT groups demand that. And I think my second point is also that I think 
that when we speak of human rights, that, that for me it's important to say that also the human is for me a very political category. It's a very deeply political category. And we have to look at you know, the histories and the, the current stories, who is being perceived as human. And not all people are counted as human. For example, in the, in the war on terror, and some people are more human than others. Or count their lives count as more human than others. So the inclusion into the concept of human is also a political struggle. So I think this to keep in mind that we have to claim LGBTIQs are humans. It's a political mm. struggle. And and the third is that that also I think with with LGBTIQ rights it's often forgotten that it's not only about civil individual rights it's also about economic and social rights and when we talk about uh, inequalities and and the neoliberal um, economy it's important to keep that in mind that there are, is a connection between poverty and and LGBTIQ rights. So that it's also a question of, of e economic, uh, you know, justice when you use the word justice. And, and the structural adjustment programs in the 80s, you know, they were completely against economic and, 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 and uh, social justice. So just let's not forget the material, you know, reality, the economy, when, when I think it's for me important when we struggle for LGBTIQ justice. So... Yeah. Um, I was wondering, um, we were talking about the evangelist group that came to Uganda and uh, promoted the anti-homosexual laws. And uh, we see religion being used as a tool for, for hate everywhere, also in Europe. And um, I was wondering how you, how you see the relationship between religion in your work, in your human activism, and in promoting rights for homosexuals. Do you keep count of, of that? Do you try to to um, give the knowledge about how maybe Christian religion or Muslim, Muslim religion can work with being homosexual, or do you just try to separate? Oh, we don't separate because we are a very religious country, uh, as, as Uganda. And uh, we, of course, even our our community, we, many people are very religious. We just have to continue to preach that you cannot use uh, religion for hate. Uh, but uh, the, the, the problem is the spaces, the, the avenues for us to do that are very limited in the country because they are taken over by religious anti-gay groups to preach their, their gospel. But uh, we don't separate it, we continue to use it. But we also remind people that this Bible that they are using, all the Korans and all this, are not really ours, because they keep talking about an African, and everything they're using to condemn us is actually not African. So who gets to decide what is African and not? Today you're saying that, that uh, we are homosexuality is not African, but you're the same person using the Bible to condemn me, which is an African. So we just have to continue to, to spread the right information to people to understand. And so we, we partner with our religious leaders in, in the country who who are, who are actually friendly and who have studied even sexuality that help us to take this message because they are, re they are respected uh, people in society. So if they go and talk to people, at least people can start to change their attitudes towards them, uh, towards us. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, who, who am I to go and start talking to people? You know, it becomes difficult. But, but if we get um, people who are for example, Desmond Tutu has been openly supportive on the African continent. Uh, unfortunately, in Uganda, the bishop who, has, who is openly supportive uh, has been excommunicated from church. So, um, so some people no longer really listen to him because he's been excommunicated from church. But we have others on the continent that are actually standing in solidarity with us and trying to take the message to as many people as possible. But there's no way we can run away from religion. It's part and parcel. I think the problem is also that sometimes in this idea of sexual modernization that that it's very much linked to secularization. And I think it's quite I think we can really learn from your your activism that you claim the spirit the spiritual, you know, the the religious 
Because in, in, I think in Europe, LGBT movements would always consider themselves as very secular, and this is the, the, the way forward. And I really, you know, that's really a point I, I learned from, from, from reading. Um, yeah, because we can't do. run away. We can't run away from the um, from the people who are against us. Because yeah. if we run away from them, then we will not be able to provide them the right information, and we shall not get them on our to change their attitude. So we have to work with them. Like in Uganda, we work with the Uganda police. It keeps arresting our people, put, exposing them in the media. But the next day, we are going to be at the police station, advocating with them because we we know we need them. Uh, during our first pride, they came and arrested us. But now, for the last three prides, they are protecting us because we kept lobbying and lobbying mm -hmm. and saying, you need to protect us. We are citizens of this country. And now we have a very good relationship with the, with the uh, Inspector General of Police. We even have a direct line to someone to contact in case they've arrested one of our persons. So we have to just continue. We can't run away from the people who are against us. So we are more or less coming uh, to the conclusion of, um, of, of today's session, as interesting as it is. But one of the things I want to um, ask is, um, I know, Tasha, I mean, you've touched a little bit on, and um, we've mentioned here this question of violence, right? And I'm thinking in the face of, of so much violence, be it verbal abuse, beatings, threats, or threats of violence, um, and so on and so forth, where do you find the strength to keep fighting for? Um, the human rights of, of sexual minorities in Uganda. And, and I saw the video, I think, on the British uh, Railway with World Stories, where he said, I think he actually said, um, uh, there, there, is, there is hope, is what you were saying. And so I'm wondering, where do you find the strength? And, and what the thing is this you get angry, you get tired, and you can't keep putting your head in the sand. You need to stand up and try to see that how can I make this. this this space better for me to stop getting angry. Because if you get angry and you just cover yourself in the sun, you're not making any situation better. But also knowing that one day we shall get there. I know we are going to lose people along the way. We've already started losing so many along the way. Uh, it's not going to be easy that uh, we, we've come to come to you know realize that it's not going to be easy. So I built a network around myself. Uh, friends around the world, uh, in my country, my family, that at least I know every time I go out and it becomes hot, I know I have someone to, to run to, a shoulder to cry on. But just knowing that one day it will get better. It, it wasn't like this where we are seated here uh, a few decades ago, but today people are on the parades and marching and all this because some people sacrificed and made life uh, a little better. So knowing that we are not alone keeps me going. And with Christine, I don't know if you have any final comments, because I, I know for you it's not just academic, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if you have any um, points on this question of hope for strength to continue this I think probably for me it's the same, because I, I have been working in the feminist and queer LGBTIQ movement uh, for uh, since I'm, I don't know, 16 or something like that. and. I have also been beaten up in Austria, so, and I was quite hurt. Um, and I think, but you know, to really feel this community and knowing that something has to change and that we have to do that, you know, you don't have a choice. It's not that you decide you want to be an activist or a, a queer scholar because I feel I'm a queer activist scholar, maybe. Um, you don't have the choice. You, you really, have to do that just because you you have to so yeah i think it's it's also important to 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 connect that idea of ac activism and and scholarship together and for me it's very important it keeps me going also okay well we're actually uh, wrapping up and this is a quick comment yeah okay. and then probably the last question um, <laughs> Yeah, I, before I say it, I just want to congratulate you for the work you're doing. And, uh, you also uh, said that I admire your tenacity and the courage that you need to you know, do your work. I mean, it's quite admirable. Um, my question is that listening to you, I 
get to the issues using quiet diplomacy to get certain things, certain results. And then also, when you are pushed to the wall, you use the, the non-quiet diplomacy. You know. I mean, looking at the context which we are coming from, I mean, Africa, you find two key complex issues, cultural dynamics and then issues of religious dynamics, which are very strong. My, what is bugging my mind right now is these are very entrenched in Africa. And like you've already said, you are already having issues with the religious aspect. I just can't foresee how this is. I see it as a brilliant task for you to, to probably break through these two serious core, I mean, dynamics. How, how do you think? Because these are huge in Africa. And I just see it as a huge task. Which the thing is this, um, we don't isolate ourselves. So we work with other social justice movements, like the feminist movement, the human rights movement, to see how to go about things. Uh, I'm in court all the time suing the government, suing newspapers, because I'm, I'm trying to use all avenues to see what can, what can help us get there. Um, uh, so there's no one singular thing singular way that we are going to win this. We just have to use all to try and see what is working. Uh, we lose court cases, the next day we are back to court. Uh, we lose in Uganda, we are in the East African Court of Justice, and that is using the legal law. And then we are like using the media. The media is calling for the hanging of homosexuals. What can we do? They are calling, exposing people who are homosexuals. What can we do about it? Let's give it to them. Let's give them that you're not shaming us anymore. So we go and get our own media and use it. And that's why I have the magazine and TV and radio. People are now saying, OK, let's give them, instead of them writing false things in the name of shaming us, people are, uh, are telling their own stories on TV, on radio, and in the magazine. And we distribute this around the whole country, even to the president's office. And the president even sends people to meet with us. The minister is threatening to arrest us. He's calling the press conference to ban all the newspapers. But we are meeting with the president. So you know. We use all different avenues to see how can we go. Like for HIV and AIDS, we said we need to go to the global fund and sit on that. No one is going to talk for us. We need to get someone to sit for us, uh, to make decisions for us. What are we going to do? If they don't want the issue of homosexuality or LGBT, let's use se sexual minorities. Let's use MSM. Whatever it takes to get there, we shall use it. So it's just different strategies for di different ways. Uh, and it's not going to be easy, as you've said, but we've seen even former presidents now coming out, and the former president of Botswana coming out and actually apologizing for not doing enough when he was still in power. Uh, recently, um, Mozambique uh, decriminalized homosexuality. So we just have to learn from each other. That's why we have networks around the continent. We meet as a continent, as lesbians on the continent. What can we share? What can we do? What is bothering us? We meet as trans uh, on the continent, and then we meet as LGBT on the continent and share best practices, experiences. People kept coming to Uganda saying, how did you manage to get civil society to work with you? So we just have to use everything at our disposal to see what leads us there. Because we are not now going to go just straight to decriminalization. Because the law can just can, can be useful in regulating, but it's not going to take away the minds that people have. So we have to use, we are busy getting the laws away, but we are also changing people's attitudes. We just have to use everything. On that note, I'd like to thank you, Kasha and Christine, for being with us today. Thank you.